uh, glycosylation is the process of activating sugars and assemble sugars to sugar chains. And then we use the, the structures to decorate proteins. And um, when you think about sugar metabolism or carbohydrate metabolism, probably you think about uh, hypoglycemia or burning sugars, but this is the opposite. Actually, you use the sugar molecules to build something. And this is like a secret information you, can, you could add to a protein and that protein would work much, much better with the decoration or antenna. And that sugar antenna is sequentially built and there's a lot of genetic information in that. And then if it's not built right or it's missing, then the protein will malfunction. Now about 90% of our functional proteins are glycosylated. So you can imagine that such a disorder could cause very bizarre clinical features. So if you think about glycosylated proteins in your body, um, all your coagulation factors, almost all, um, anticoagulation factors, hormone regulators like ACTH, FSA, sex hormones, DSH, AC, uh, I already said that, um, can be abnormal at the same time. So the patient can have like a thrombosis and a bleeding, hypothyroidism and hypoglycemia and delayed sexual maturation. So it's a really very complex picture. I didn't even mention that many transporter proteins are glycosylated, but obviously you don't check all these details when a baby is born. So what you see at birth is usually a beautiful baby, not really different uh, from other babies. Maybe there are subtle dysmorphic features or inverted nipples or fat distribution abnormalities. Some, so not, nothing striking. And then about the age of three months, um, the parents notice uh, some hypotonia. And then uh, at six months, the developmental delay is um, apparent. So then it's very nonspecific. And if you don't do a broad screening, for example, liver transaminases, um, hormones, um, uh, coagulation, you probably don't do because don't expect to have an, a problem, right? Um, then you might miss the diagnosis. And realistically, even in the age of exome sequencing, most of our patients won't get diagnosed before the age of one year. And if I think about the most common CDGs, then there are um, little um, uh, clues, and especially this inverted nipple I mentioned and the abnormal fat distribution in um, uh, combination with hypotonia, developmental delay, and feeding problems. I think this is the classic presentation. And if you are a good dysmorphologist, uh, maybe even strabismus, I should mention, although it's non-specific. These help you to diagnose early. The problem is that there are 159 other CDGs which are not so straightforward. And um, I think that nowadays um, we are doing a lot of whole exome and whole genome-based uh, studies when we don't really have a good idea what kind of syndrome it could be. Um, and um, I think that uh, maybe 70% of our diagnos new diagnosis um, come from whole exome or whole genome compared to 30%, which comes uh, through brilliant physicians recognizing the uh, dysmorphic features and the, the special biochemical signature. So how could you speed up diagnostics, and, and that's, a, that's a very difficult question. And I think that what we do now, uh, for example, at Mayo Clinic, that uh, we already uh, screen all of our premature and sick babies at the nursery and, and do whole uh, genome sequencing um, uh, at the spot. So this uh, new approach, um, you know, screening babies which are non-specific in their presentation, but have an early 
presentation of potential genetic disease could speed up the diagnosis significantly.